video is sponsored by squarespace.com slash Michael Penn. Get 10% off your purchase of a website or domain when you use my link in the description and pinned comment. This video is brought to you by squarespace.com slash Michael Penn. If you're a viewer of this channel, you probably know what the derivative is and also the second derivative and the third derivative. But what about the half derivative? or the three halves derivative, or really a derivative attached to a number which is not a non-negative integer. Well, that's where things get a little confusing. So there are a couple of other videos on YouTube about this so-called fractional calculus, but I think they mostly use the Cauchy integral formula to define the fractional derivative. Well, I just stumbled upon another way to define the fractional derivative, and I thought I'd make a video about it. And so I'll call this like a transformation approach to fractional calculus. And this is in the spirit of fractional derivatives defined by Louisville, Fourier, and some others. And it's gonna require some tools. The first is the Laplace transform. You could also use the Fourier transform. Let's recall that the Laplace transform of a function f of t is equal to the integral from zero to infinity of f of t times e to the minus st dt. So this outputs a function of s. We're also gonna need something called the gamma function. And so gamma of z, where z could really be a complex number, is the integral from zero to infinity of x to the z minus one times e to the minus x dx. And one of the really important parts of the gamma function is that it's some sort of smooth generalization of a factorial. In particular, gamma of n is equal to n minus 1 factorial if we've got a natural number n. So I thought I'd start off with some Laplace transform examples so we have an idea for how this goes. Let's start with maybe the simplest thing, which is the Laplace transform of the constant function 1. So by our definition right here, that'll be the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus st dt. But that thing's pretty easy to take the antiderivative of. Since t is the variable of integration, we have this minus s is like a constant. So by reversing the chain rule, we have this is minus one over s times e to the minus st evaluated from zero up to the limit as t approaches infinity. So as t approaches infinity, this exponential thing will go to zero, at least for positive values of s, and that's, we'll and that's what we'll assume is that s is positive. But then if we evaluate this at zero, we get e to the zero, which is one, but then since that's in the lower bound of our evaluation, that'll be attached to a minus sign, which cancels this minus sign, giving us one over s. So there's our first example of a Laplace transform. The Laplace transform of one is equal to one over s. And we can generalize this pretty easily. The Laplace transform is, it's easy to see that it's a linear operator, meaning that the Laplace transform of any constant is simply that constant over s. That'll be important as we move forward. Now, next up, let's look at the Laplace transform of t. And so that'll be equal to the integral from zero to infinity of t times e to the minus st dt. Okay, well, how would we evaluate something like this? Well, I think we'd probably use my friend Blackpin Redpin's favorite di method. So let's build our chart. So we're gonna take derivatives down this column, antiderivatives down this column. You always put polynomials in the derivative column because they get simpler when you take the derivative. So we'll have t here and then e to the minus s t here. Taking derivatives, we get one and then zero. Taking antiderivatives, we get minus one over s e to the minus s t and then positive one over s squared e to the minus s t. And then let's recall that we will match on the diagonal like this. 
and then we'll alternate the signs. So the first one's attached to a plus and the second one is attached to a minus. And that gives us our antiderivative. So let's see, we'll have minus t over s, e to the minus st, evaluated from zero to the limit as t approaches infinity. And then we'll have minus one over s squared, e to the minus st, evaluated from zero to t approaching infinity, like that. But now let's look that this is zero in both instances. In particular, if we plug in zero, well, the t in the numerator makes it zero. And then if we take the limit as t approaches infinity, we'll also get zero because this exponential term will win out. So this thing right here turns into zero. But then here, the infinite limit will give us zero, but we'll get one plugged into the exponential for zero, leaving us with a one over s squared, because the two minus signs cancel just like they did before. Now from here, using fairly similar methods, we can come up with the following nice formula. So for, I'll say just like n, which is a non-negative integer, so it's in z bigger than or equal to zero, we have the Laplace transform of t to the n is equal to, let's see, is equal to n factorial over s to the n plus one. So notice that our first two examples satisfy this rule. This is like t to the zero, so we get zero factorial, which is one, over s to the zero plus one. This is t to the one, we get one factorial over s to the one plus one. But while we're at it, I'm gonna introduce something called the inverse Laplace transform, which is just the inverse operation. So let's maybe set it up like this. So we can define it in terms of this equation. So that means that the inverse Laplace transform of n factorial over s to the n plus one is simply equal to t to the n. But then by linearity here, we can bring that n factorial out and move it over and we have the following formula. The inverse Laplace transform of one over s to the n plus one is equal to let's see, t to the n over n factorial. And let's put a couple boxes around this stuff. So there's our inverse Laplace transform of one over s to the n plus one, and then the corresponding Laplace transform of t to the n. But now what we'd like to do is generalize this to something where n is not an integer but we can maybe guess what that would look like by using this fact right here. The gamma function evaluated at n is n minus one factorial. So let's see, what does that mean? So that means that this n factorial should maybe be seen as gamma of n plus one. And that's of course like in both places. Okay, so perhaps we have this nice guess for our Laplace transform and then its inverse as well, which would be the Laplace transform of t to the, I'll call it alpha, looks like it should be gamma evaluated at alpha plus one over s to the alpha plus one. And then likewise, we would have a corresponding um, inverse Laplace transform formula, which would be something like this the inverse Laplace transform of one over s to the alpha plus one looks like it should be equal to t to the alpha over gamma of alpha plus one. But if we can show this one, then the other one follows. And so let's actually show this formula at the top of the next board. Airspace has raised the bar with their next generation website design system, Fluid Engine. It's never been easier to stretch your imagination online. You can share your stories of your cat, photos of your cat, videos of your cat, and schedule all of your cat content to make your cat work for your cat. Uh, for you. Wait, can cat create websites and post photos?
Let's start with a best in class website template for every category and use case. Add customizing every design detail and multiply all of that by drag and drop technology for desktop and mobile devices. Squarespace connects you to vetted tools to extend your website's functionality. Need to announce a sale or send a newsletter? Email campaigns with built-in analytics measure the impact of every send. And speaking of analytics, Squarespace allows you to learn where your site visits and sales are coming from and analyze which channels are most effective. So wait no longer. Get 10% off a website or domain by going to the link on your screen, the description, and pinned comment. Now, back to whatever problem I was working on. So we motivated the following formula on the last board, that the Laplace transform of t to the alpha is equal to gamma to the alpha plus one over s to the alpha plus one. And here, you know, maybe alpha could be any real number that makes all of these parts make sense. So for instance, gamma evaluated at negative integers doesn't really make sense. So we have to be a little bit careful about that. But I think we're gonna gloss over that because that's not really the point of the video. Okay, so let's see how this might go. We'll go directly from the definition of the Laplace transform. So we'll take Laplace transform of t to the alpha, so that's defined to be the integral from zero to infinity of t to the alpha times e to the minus s t dt. So something like that. And now let's do a substitution, and our substitution will be in line to make our thing look like this formula over here. So let's see. Let's maybe set, I'll call it x, equal to s times t. So note that that means that t is equal to x over s, which means that dt is equal to dx over s. And then what about our bounds of integration? Well, when t is equal to zero, that tells us that x is equal to zero, just by plugging that in right there. And then likewise, as t approaches infinity, x also approaches infinity. Recall that s is like positive in this setup. Okay, so let's see what that leaves us with. So now we'll have the integral from zero to infinity. We'll replace t with x over s. So we have x to the alpha over s to the alpha. And then we'll have e to the minus and then we'll have e to the minus x, and then dt is now dx over s. But now with respect to this integral, s is a constant. So I can bring all the s's out, leaving with one over s to the alpha plus one, and then, that, then I have the integral from zero to infinity of x to the, I'm gonna write this in a funny way, alpha plus one minus one times e to the minus x dx. But if we look at this integral right here, it's exactly what we need it to be by this definition of the gamma function. So in particular, what I mean is that this person is equal to gamma evaluated at alpha plus one, seeing this alpha plus one right here. So that means here we get gamma of alpha plus one over s to the alpha plus one. And that finishes the proof of this claim. And now we're gonna hold on this for later and also like its inverse version. Let's maybe write down its inverse version so that we have it. That would be something like this. The inverse Laplace transform of one over s to the alpha plus one is equal to, let's see, t to the alpha over gamma of alpha plus one. Okay, so those are like the two formulas that we'll need later. But we need another property of the Laplace transform before we go on. Okay, so our next little claim that we need is how the Laplace transform interacts with the derivative, the normal derivative that we know. And that is the Laplace transform of f prime of t is equal to s times the Laplace transform of f of t minus f evaluated at zero. Or more generally, the Laplace transform of the nth derivative of f is equal to s to the n, the Laplace transform of f, minus a bunch of other terms, which are different levels of derivatives of f all evaluated at zero. And then let's maybe prove this first one, and then the other one is really just an exercise in induction based off of the first one. Okay, so we're gonna have the Laplace transform of f prime of t. 
So by definition, that's the integral from zero to infinity of f prime of t times e to the minus st dt. But let's maybe rewrite this a little bit as the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus st times f prime of t dt. And looking at it like that, it really motivates us to do integration by parts. And that's exactly what we'll do. So let's take these last two terms, and those will be our dv terms. And let's take this right here, and that'll be our u term. And then let's recall the formula for integration by parts. I guess you could like push together a version of the di method for this as well. But when things are general like this, I like to write out the integration by parts. Okay, so anyway, we have the integral u dv is equal to u v minus the integral of v du. Okay, great. So that means we need to calculate v and du, but we'll do that like on the spot. But if dv is this, it's pretty clear that v is simply the original function. So our u times v term will look like e to the minus st times f of t. We need to evaluate that from zero up to infinity. And then next up, we'll have minus v du. So let's see, that'll be minus the integral from zero to infinity. Well, v, like we said, was just the function. But then we need to take the derivative of this with respect to t. Notice a minus s will come down because of the chain rule. The minus sign will cancel this minus sign, giving us a plus, and then we can bring the s out because it's a constant with respect to the integration, and we're left with f of t times e to the minus st dt. But let's see, if we evaluate or limit this to infinity, we'll have the exponential will take over. Here we're assuming that f is a so-called sub-exponential function. If we evaluate that at zero, we get f evaluated at zero. So that gives us minus f evaluated at zero plus s times that integral. But upon closer inspection, that integral is simply the Laplace transform. So there we've got the Laplace transform of f of t. Okay, so there we have it. And then, like I said, this general formula will follow by an inductive argument. Okay, we need one more thing before we can define our fractional derivative in terms of these parts. So the last tool that we'll need is the Laplace transform of the delta function. So, in fact, we'll show that the Laplace transform of the delta function is simply the constant one. But that means that the inverse Laplace transform of any constant is simply equal to that constant times the delta function. Again, because of the linearity of all of this. So, the Laplace transform of delta of t is simply the integral from zero up to infinity of, let's see, we'll have delta of t times e to the minus st dt. Oh, but what does the delta function do? Well, it picks out the value of this function at zero as long as our bounds of integration include zero. And they in fact do. So kind of by motivating definition of the delta function, that should give us e to the minus st evaluated at zero. In other words, e to the minus s times zero, which is equal to one. So that's really all there is to it. Okay, so now we're ready to go for it. So now we're gonna do a little bit of exploring to write down this definition of our fractional derivative. So I'm gonna introduce this notation that d of f of t is equal to f prime of t. So d is like our derivative operator. Okay, so let's start with this. We have d of f of t. Well, that's equal to, like I said, f prime of t. But now what we'll do is apply the Laplace transform and then the inverse Laplace transform. They should, of course, cancel each other out. It's equal to the inverse Laplace transform of the Laplace transform of f prime of t. But let's look closely at that and recognize that we had a formula for this Laplace transform of the derivative. And in fact, what it was was the Laplace transform of the original function minus the original function evaluated at zero. 
Okay, so that means we can put that in this inverse Laplace transform. So we have inverse Laplace transform of S, Laplace transform of original minus F of zero. But now we'll apply the linearity of the inverse Laplace transform to give us inverse Laplace transform of S times the Laplace transform of F of T minus inverse Laplace transform of F of zero. Okay, but let's do a little aside to what we should take for this. So by our last claim, f of zero is a constant, well, f of zero is always a constant, but by our last claim, we can write this as that constant times the delta function. Great. But the delta function is zero almost everywhere. Well, except at zero where it's infinite. So let's maybe make an assumption to take advantage of that. And the assumption that we'll make is that t is strictly bigger than zero. But if t is strictly bigger than zero, then this delta function is equal to zero. And so that cancels out. And then we have it, right? So we have the derivative of f of t is equal to the inverse Laplace transform of s times the Laplace transform of f of t. Now let's write a one right here. And by this one, I mean we're applying that derivative operator one time. And what we'll end up with is, well, we're applying that multiplication by s one time. So the trick here is this turns differentiation into multiplication by s along with applying these Laplace transforms. And then you can check this, and maybe I won't do this, but it's not so hard to check that if we take the derivative operator two times of f of t, and do this same calculation, you'll end up with the inverse Laplace transform of S squared times the Laplace transform of F of T. So look at that. We've got the derivative happening twice turns into multiplication by S twice. So I think that means that it's a, a reasonable definition for our fractional derivative to be defined as follows. So let's take alpha to be a real number and we can, and we, and we can define the alpha -th derivative of f, in other words, this derivative operator applied alpha times to be equal to the inverse Laplace transform of s to the alpha times the Laplace transform of f of t. Okay, so now let's maybe check that this makes sense. So we just motivated this definition of our fractional derivative. So the alpha -th derivative for any real number alpha of f of t is equal to the inverse Laplace transform of s to the alpha times the Laplace transform of f. So that means we could take the half derivative of something and by, and to keep things simple, let's take the half derivative of just the function t. And then we're gonna take the half derivative of that just to make sure that if you take two half derivatives, you get a whole derivative. Well, at least in this example. Okay, so the half derivative of t will be equal to the inverse Laplace transform of, let's see, s to the one half times the Laplace transform of t. Okay, but by our previous calculation, we know what the Laplace transform of t is. It's simply one over s squared. So like I said, that's from some previous stuff that we did. Okay, so that's gonna give us, let's see, the inverse Laplace transform of s to the one half times one over s squared, in other words, one over s to the three halves. Oh, but we've got an inverse Laplace transform formula for that using what we saw with the gamma function. So this is in fact equal to t to the one half over gamma to the three halves. Let's just recall that we want to think about this three halves as one plus one half, or one half plus one, so it fits into our formula that we had written on the board. But now we would need gamma to the three halves. 
So maybe I won't go through that calculation here, but if you just use this definition of the gamma function, apply some changes of variables to integration, and do a couple of other tricks, this simplifies to something that looks a lot like the Gaussian integral. And in fact, what we'll get here is, let's see, it will be two times t to the one half over the square root of pi. So like I said, it looks like the Gaussian integral. Well, let's just do a quick check to see if this makes sense. Well, the half derivative of t, well, the whole derivative t of t would be the number one. It would decrease the power of t by one. So it stands to reason that the half derivative of t would decrease the power of t by one half, and that's exactly what happened here. And you could actually check that this is like kind of working generally. So let's maybe look at that. So if we take the half derivative of t to the, I'll call it the r power. So that's gonna be the inverse Laplace transform of s to the 1 half times the Laplace transform of t to the r. But luckily we know exactly what this is by some stuff that we worked for by some stuff that we worked out earlier. So this is the gamma function evaluated at r plus one over s to the r plus one. Okay, but now we can put this stuff together, bring that gamma function out. We have gamma function of r plus one, and then the inverse Laplace transform of, let's see what it is, one over S, s to the r minus half plus one. So I wrote it in that particular way so we could apply that inverse Laplace transform you know, pretty easily. So let's see, the inverse Laplace transform after being applied, well, we've got this gamma to the r plus one that comes out, and then we'll end up with t to the r minus half over some gamma function. And I believe in this case, it's gamma evaluated at r plus half. Okay, so we get some constant, and then after that constant, we have t to the r minus half. So let's see, a regular derivative of t to the r would give us some constant times t to the r minus one. We decrease the exponent by the number of derivatives we took. Well, and that's exactly what happens here. We took a half derivative here and we decreased the exponent by a half. Okay, well, let's maybe get rid of this generally thing and then we'll check that if we take another half derivative, we actually get a whole derivative. So now we're gonna finish off our toy example. Let's take the half derivative of the half derivative of t. So that turns into two over pi, square root of pi by linearity and then the half derivative of t to the half. So I applied this first half derivative. But now let's apply this rule for our half derivative. And so that's gonna give us, well, this two over the square root of pi stays the same. And then we have the inverse Laplace transform of s to the half, and then the Laplace transform of t to the half. Okay, but then again, we're gonna use our knowledge of the Laplace transform of t to the half. To give us, in fact, something familiar, this will be the gamma function evaluated at three halves over s to the one half plus one, which is three halves. So we're left with something like that. But then again, let's recall that the gamma function of three halves is equal to square root of pi over two. Okay, so we can bring that out and we're left with two over root pi originally, root pi over two from that term, and then we'll have the inverse Laplace transform of s to the half times one over s to the three halves. Well, that simplifies out to one over s. But let's see, these two are clearly reciprocals of each other, so those give us one. And then likewise, we saw that the Laplace transform of one was one over s, meaning the inverse Laplace transform of one over s is also one. So we get one times one, which is equal to one, which is maybe not so interesting. What is interesting is that this is the full derivative of t. So at least in this example, what we've shown is that the half derivative applied twice gives us the whole derivative.
And I think you could maybe tweak this along with our more generally argument to show this for any power of t. Doing it for a general function might be a little trickier, but you know, I urge you to try. Maybe post in the comments if everything worked out. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.